Why the Netherlands isn't under water? Today we're gonna find that out. I mean, I already watched the video before, but yeah, when when it's something, some stuff like that, that it's really complicated, it's better to watch multiple videos so you will finally get a grasp of how you actually do that. So yeah, let's check it out. This is gonna be interesting. Let's go. This episode of Real Engineering was brought to you by Skillshare, home to over 16,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. The first 500 people to sign up with the link in the description will get a two month free trial. On a cold and stormy morning in January 1953, the Princess Victoria Ferry was preparing to leave its dock in Stranois on the southwest coast of Scotland, despite gale force warnings. An hour into its journey, its captain radioed for help as the storm forced the ferry on its side, making it impossible to board the lifeboats. Of the 176 people aboard the Princess Victoria, only 43 survived. But there was more tragedy to come. This storm was headed south towards the Netherlands, and with the moon and sun causing even higher tides, this storm would severely test the flood defences of the Netherlands, which was still getting back on its feet after the Second World War. The storm would ultimately claim the lives of 1,835 people in the Netherlands, wow. along with 200,000 cattle and flooding 2,000 square kilometers of land, destroying 43,000 homes and forcing 72,000 people to flee. Today we're going to learn That's why this crazy. happened and how it would spark the construction of one of the seven modern wonders of the world, the Dutch Delta Works. After World War II, the meandering levees on the coast of the Netherlands had fallen into disrepair. The Netherlands were just getting back onto their feet after five years of German occupation, just eight years prior to the storm. The poorly maintained flood defences were a disaster waiting to happen. As the storm approached, it forced water inland with nowhere to go but up. This put intense pressure on the dikes and levees of the Low Countries, and by storm's end, 139 kilometres of levees would be heavily damaged, with holes up to 3.5 kilometres being torn open. With nearly 26% of the Netherlands land area being under sea level, seawater burst through these breaches with immense strength, oh, causing damage that would take why. decades to repair, and would spur the formation of the Delta Committee just 20 days later, to ensure this could never happen again, and this is what they came up with. The new Delta plan would shorten the Dutch coastline by 700 kilometers by closing the primary inlets in these four locations. This would drastically reduce the length of levees and dikes that needed to be inspected and maintained, and thus decreasing the chances of weak points jeopardizing the safety of the Dutch people. However, this was no easy task and would come with an enormous cost. Before these works could be completed, additional barriers needed to be erected upstream to improve fresh and salt water management and prevent fresh water emptying from the Rhine, Meuse and Scheldt River from redirecting around these new dams. The northernmost closure dam also needed to be equipped with a hydraulic sluice capable of dealing with the output of the Rhine River, as this fresh water would flood the Netherlands from the other direction if it was prevented from emptying into the North Sea. On top of all this, a number of ports such as the port of Rotterdam and the port of Antwerp had to- Just want to stop for a second and ask you guys to tell me in the comments if you knew about all this, because this is really interesting. I watched about it in another video, but I didn't really understand it fully. This one explains quite well. Stay accessible. So aside from the fixed dams, bridges and sluices, two new locks that would allow an inland ship route between Antwerp and Rotterdam needed to be built. Amazingly, on top of all this work, the Dutch still managed to consider the environmental impact of this work. The largest of the structures built for the Delta Works project, the Oosterschelde Storm Surge Barrier, was originally planned to completely close the mouth of this river, which would create a freshwater basin. However, resistance to this plan arose as it would completely change the saltwater environment of the area. The Ustershell scenery is unique with a great variety of fish, water plants and animals. So in 1976, the Dutch government agreed- Yeah, but like when it's about, I can understand the protests, you know, ambientalists and all that, but when it's about uh, human lives, come on, are you really gonna prioritize nature and all stuff like that over the life of actual people? I mean, we are the dominant race for a reason, right? I mean, come on, are you really gonna sacrifice all these people's lives? Did they have to relocate, go to other places just because you have to protect the nature? That's a tough question to answer. I'm not a philosopher, so I won't try to do that, but uh, I don't know if I'm in the right saying that I prioritize the life of people. Yeah, definitely. Go on. Read to a different plan, building an open barrier that could be closed during heavy storms and high tides, adding another 2.5 billion euros to the cost of the project. This barrier wow. is nine kilometers long with 62 openings, each 40 meters wide 
allowing the tidal movement to remain intact. To build a structure this massive that needs to not only support its own weight, but the enormous force of a storm surge pushing against it would require extensive foundations. The first part of these foundations were created by forming two islands, the biggest of which housing a lock to allow ships to pass through the barrier. This island even included a massive dry dock to construct the 65 pylons needed to support the sluice gates, each using 7,000 cubic meters of concrete and taking one and a half years to build. Between each island a trench was dug. On both sides of the trench, mats were placed to keep the seabed in place, while specially built ships were then used to consolidate the sand at the bottom of the trench. Using special vibrating needles, the sand would be vibrated to pack the sand firmly together, creating a surface that could carry the weight of the massive pylons. The trench itself was then covered with specially made mats filled with rocks to prevent erosion of the underlying sand. The pylons were left hollow so they could be picked up by another purpose-built U-shaped ship and moved into place. There, inside of the trench, on top of the mats, they would be lowered, filled with sand and closed with concrete. The wide foot of each pylon was packed in stone, as it is vital the pylons never move because if even one of the massive 260 to 480 ton doors cannot move, the current in that location could become enormous and potentially damage the structure. Finally, these enormous hydraulic pistons were attached to the sluice gates, allowing 3 kilometers of the 9 km long storm surge barrier to open and close on demand. This project truly is one of the modern wonders of the world, allowing the Dutch to rule the tide and ensure the chances of another devastating flood are dramatically reduced. But with sea levels continuing to rise in warmer seas causing even stronger storms, we need to remind ourselves of the lessons learned here. The flooding of New Orleans in 2005 occurred for many of the same reasons as the 1953 flooding of the Netherlands. Poorly maintained levees broke well below their design tolerances, wow. allowing 80% of the city to be flooded in just 5 hours. Had New Orleans Ew. taken lessons from history and reduced the length of the defences needed, as they have done now with the $1.1 billion Lake Bourne surge barrier, they may have saved over 1,000 people and prevented the $108 billion of damage the storm caused. If these trends continue, cities around the world are going to have to seriously assess the risk of flooding and make plans to prevent any chance of a flood taking the lives of their citizens. So you may have admired some of the footage yeah, I mean... Probably Benny's should be the next online to prevent that, right? This video. It's not the first time I've traveled to a location to get footage, but it is the first time I felt really prepared because I finally learned the necessary skills to use my equipment like a professional from Skillshare. Mm. I learned all the technical terms and settings to set up my still time. shots of the storm surge barrier. I learned how to get cinematic shots with my drone and I learned how to apply the correct color correction too. Skillshare is simply the best place on the internet to learn creative skills that could help you develop a new life skill. With professional and understandable classes that follow a clear learning curve, you could even learn the skills to start a new business like I did with this channel through courses for animation and editing. A oh, premium really membership cool. starts around $10 a month for unlimited access to all courses, but the first 500 people to sign up with this link will get a two month free trial. In those two months you could easily learn the I doubt them still on time. <laughs> Seven years ago, wow. The skills you need to start a new hobby or business. So ask yourself right now, what skill have you been putting yeah, off learning? Really what project have you been dreaming of completing but you aren't sure if you have the skills to do it? Why not start right now and sign up to Skillshare using the link below? You've nothing to lose and a valuable life skill to gain. As usual, thank you for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters for helping this channel exist. If you'd like to see more from me or see more content from Real Engineering, like sneak peeks for upcoming videos, check out the links from my Instagram. That was really interesting. I wonder... I mean, one question came to my mind throughout the whole video. You know, you guys, the Dutch, found a solution to this problem. And that's great. That's truly amazing. But this is because of modern technology and everything it was already been learned in engineering. What if something like that would have happened, let's say, five centuries ago? Or even one or two... No, one century. Yeah, it was one century ago. Maybe two or three centuries ago. Do you think the you guys would still find a solution to this problem or we wouldn't have a Netherlands right now. I mean, at least in the location where it's located right now. Let me know down in the comments what you think about it. I always like to think a little bit out of the box. I don't know. I just want to know if you think the same way. Anyways, guys, this video was really interesting. So thank you so much for the recommendation. 
Whatever video you want me to check out, let me know down in the comments and I will try my best to bring you a reaction very soon. Stay safe and have a nice day. Bye bye.